thank you so much. And um, it, it looked to me like a significant number of you were at my last talk, which is really great, because I'm kind of going to enter in with the assumption that we have that foundation and only do a little bit of kind of review and reinforcement. And so, you know, you can help me out. I encourage you to ask questions for clarity and for what I think of as grappling, right? Grappling to understand what I'm saying will hold the kind of, don't you think that this is the answer versus this is the answer. That kind of stuff will hold to the end. Um, what I want us to do in the first part is to just do the best we can to understand what I'm saying. And, and of course, please ask questions, because I can forget um, how conversant and comfortable I am with these, with these kind of topics, right? And um, I would say that racism is, uh, if not uh, arguably the most charged and sensitive topic in our society. Um, it's uncomfortable to talk about. It brings up a lot of feelings for people. Um, I hope I bring up feelings for you, uh, because if I keep you comfortable through our two hours together, then I can do a good job, because I just reinforce the status quo, which is overall comfortable for white people. Okay, and I want to interrupt that. Um, and I hope that if you do find yourself feeling defensive, um, that you can use that in a couple different ways, right? You can use that to reject what I'm saying, right? And then just put it on a niche. Uh, I, I feel defensive, therefore she's wrong. Um, you know, but there's no learning or growth for you in that, and you're just going to kind of come uh, out of this room with the same worldview you walked in with. Um, so rather than use defensiveness or emotion, uh, emotional reactions as doors out, use them as doors in. Be excited. Like, oh, okay, this is totally challenging me. I don't like that at all. Why? What can that help me uncover about the way I make meaning of race? Because there is so much depth under the surface, right? We live in a society that tells us race really has no meaning. Uh, it's really nothing, you know, focusing on race is the problem, we're post-racial, etc. And yet, by every measure, we have racial inequity, right? So this, this race, is, race has no meaning, this open-mindedness, all of this has not challenged racism. It, 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 it's not working. Or, or we could say it is working if what you want to do is hold racial inequity in place, right? Um, and so try to, try to move below the surface and, and get in touch with under there, because not only does this niceness kind of post-racial attitude not work, but it's sitting um, on top, it's pretty shallow, like right under the surface is a lot of emotions. This is also part of what's so um, confusing about race, right? So many of us claim to be open and to see everybody the same, and yet it doesn't take very much to get us angry and upset. Right? <laughs> um, and I will just tell you, that I've gotten some feedback that a couple of people that were at my talk, what they heard me say, what they took away, is that I was saying white people are bad, right? And I want to be really clear. I think racism is bad. I think we need to take responsibility. I think white people are the problem. I think, you know, in many, many ways, white people uphold the system, but often unintentionally. But it's not um, an issue of good or bad. That is not moving us forward, right? So please. Um, if, if that's what you hear me say, uh, try to challenge ch try to challenge that within yourself, because that's not what I'm saying. And actually, um, I have an image that I'll show you that I call the good bad binary, right? That I think sets up that kind of defensiveness. Oh, okay, what did I do with Twitter? So we are actually gonna start with the presumption that racism exists. So I don't tend to prove racism exists, right? I don't, I don't take the time. <laughs> It exists, okay, trust me. By every measure, uh, people of color are, are, have inequity in the United States, and to be honest, there's a hierarchy. Um, I don't wanna say some groups experience more or less racism than others, but blacks or African Americans are consistently at the bottom of every measure, right? And Latinos and Asians, actually I would probably put Native Americans, part of the way the oppression plays out for Native Americans is they're usually not on the chart at all. So a history of uh, invisibility, right? So there's hierarchy within this broad category of people of color, um, and still uh, vast disparity, right? So we're gonna start uh, from that presumption. And one of the challenges at trying to address this, like why hasn't this changed? I, I imagine every single person in this room is against racism. 
um, absolutely would never want to collude with it. Um, and yet, it hasn't changed, right? We're actually um, almost back to pre-Brown versus Board of Education levels of school segregation in the U.S. Now, what's Brown versus Board of Education? And it breaks my heart that um, this generation doesn't know what that is, right? That, that's not your fault, but that's because teachers are not teaching that. So anybody? Brown versus Board? Yeah. Desegregation of public schools. Yes, yeah, so it was the legal case that basically, up until Brown versus Board, the claim was separate but equal. It's okay if we're separate as long as we're equal, right? When of course, we weren't equal, right? We knew that. Um, but what Brown said is that separate is inherently unequal. And then it, um, it made it illegal to not allow you know, people to go to school together based on race, right? And that supposedly desegregated schools. Yeah, yeah but right now we still sitting to the end of the day where school is still sitting here. Yes. If you're delivering, have to say whatever, and if you're meant to deliver, it's still sitting here. Yes. It's still sitting here. We need the school put on to every every region. Yes. That's kind of the point I'm trying to say, right? Is that, you know, all of these you know, kind of post civil rights changes have not resulted in changing inequity, okay? So, one of the first challenges is that most of us don't know what racism is. Most of us use the terms racism, prejudice, discrimination interchangeably, and they're not the same thing. So, that's our first challenge, right? We, we try to have a conversation, we're not even using the same language. Um, and. I will just say that mainstream discourse, mainstream kind of narratives are invested in us not understanding this because that maintains the system. So prejudice is prejudgment. Every human being has prejudice towards other kinds of human beings. It's not humanly possible not to absorb ideas about groups to which you don't belong. Right? We all have prejudice. Um, and we all act on our prejudice whether we're aware of it or not. The way we see the world will inform the way we respond to the world, right? And so our prejudice does come out through discrimination. And it can be, oh, here's a great example. If you give people an online course and they believe the professor is a male versus a female, they will evaluate the professor differently. If, someone, if they believe it's, the professor is male, they'll get better evaluations. Right? And if, if you believe it's female, they'll, she'll get worse evaluations, right? It's not conscious. But there's, there's no way to avoid absorbing ideas and attitudes that position some of us as better than others, okay? So everybody has it, everybody does it. But when we get into oppression, we're backing a group's collective prejudice with control of the whole system. Now one group controls everything. And they can embed their prejudice into the very fabric and foundation of the society. Okay? And that transforms it. It's not dependent anymore on individual players. It's not dependent on intentions. It's not dependent on your self-image. The system will reproduce the inequality. Kind of the, the default will be, it will naturally happen unless you consciously interrupt it. Okay? So it's a system that works on all, all levels. And it results in an unequal distribution between white people and people of color overall, um, with whites as the beneficiaries. There is no such thing as reverse racism. There's no such thing as reverse any form of oppression, because we're talking about, when we use isms, we're talking about systems of power, and they're not fluid. Right? The same groups who have controlled all institutions continue to control them. So um, the group that's oppressed just simply isn't in the position to oppress the other group, okay? So we can just drop, <laughs> is it, is it, I, if only it was this easy that I could just tell you, but we'll try it, right? Drop that concept of reverse discrimination, of reverse racism. Everybody's prejudice, we don't need to put reverse in front of it, everybody's prejudice, People of color can have racial prejudice against me, but that at the group level, they cannot oppress me. And so we have got to reserve some language so that we can acknowledge the difference between uh, personal prejudice and institutional power. 
And the example I used um, was when, uh, in the last talk, was when women got the right to vote. Only men could give us the right to vote. Only men could take away our right to vote. We couldn't do that because we didn't control the institutions. And of course, we still don't. Got that? All right. So I like this metaphor of a birdcage because you have to understand that oppression is multifaceted. It's really hard to get past the sense of, of she's saying I'm bad or I do this or you know it's intentional, right? Um, it's happening on every level, and so you look at all of these bars, right? If we put our face right up close and we take a really uh, myopic or micro view, we're not going to see this cage at all. But if we step back and we look at the whole system, we begin to see why we're going to be able to predict this bird is going to have a very difficult time flying away. And I, I know if you were there, I used these slides last time. So we have things like our institutions, our ideology, our beliefs, our history, our culture, microaggressions, threats of violence, isolation, internalized oppression, rewards of conformity, invisibility, the burden of representation, and unacknowledged historical trauma. Those are just some examples of all of the barriers to people of color that white people don't face collectively in this society. So let me, have, let me just not make, a, make an assumption that you all know what microaggressions mean. Those are those everyday little slights. Has anybody here that is Asian heritage ever had a white person ask you where you're really from? <laughs> okay, right? Um, that's a microaggression. You know, I think I'm just being friendly. I have no idea, but the message to you is, you, is you'll always be an outsider, right? That's a microaggression. A little mix every day. Ideology. What's ideology? I got a lot of professors in the room. Any student want to take a crack at what ideology is? really cool word to know. <laughs> I love this word. Ideology are the big dominant beliefs that are reinforced throughout society um, so in, in consistently that it makes it very difficult to avoid believing it. You, you don't even know to question it um, because it's reinforced, right? So we're all unique individuals. Um, democracy is the greatest system on earth. Capitalism is the greatest system on earth. Prior to the Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, you just could not question capitalism. Right? That helped make a little space, right, where now you can question capitalism. But prior to that, it was like, what are you, communist then? Hmm. Right? Ideology, these big beliefs that are reinforced and make it difficult to question. So we're going to look at some of those ideologies today that help prop up this So I think the number one most effective adaptation to racism, um, to the challenges of the civil rights movement, I would say, um, is this idea that a racist is bad, and um, if I say that white people internalize a racist view on the world, white people um, who grow up in this culture internalize racist thoughts and attitudes because it's in the water, what, what white people often hear is, I just said you were a bad person. I just said you were immoral. And then we get the defensiveness, and then we get the arguments. Right? This is the number one reason why it's so hard to talk in a group about racism. Is people get, you know, I want to say people, white people get really defensive. Because we've been taught that to be a good person and to be participant in racism that those things are mutually exclusive and we couldn't be a good person and, and be a part of this system. We were also taught that we're all unique individuals and that I, I can simply decide to be unaffected by the society around me and see the ideologies that set that up. Okay. So we know how to fill this in. Um, a racist is bad, so they're ignorant and bigoted and uh, prejudiced mean-spirited, old, old people, right? The younger generation, you guys aren't racist. Um, Southern, usually, right? This is, our, this is our classic stereotype of a racist, right? So if you're not a racist, you're, you're nice, 
You're open-minded. You don't see color. You treat everybody the same, right? Uh, so the story goes. You're educated and progressive and open-minded and good lord, you go to the Evergreen State College. How could you possibly uh, young or young? <laughs> All right. Now, some people heard me last time, um, and they, they, they thought what I was saying is this, is this is what we want. And I'm saying this is wrong. This is what we're taught, but it's wrong. Okay? It just sets us up not to be able to understand how it actually works, and it makes us defensive, and it makes us, um, instead of looking within ourselves and examining the water and the messages, it causes us to reject and fight and push away. Have you, has anybody in this room ever had a discussion on racism and had it go really smoothly? <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. about what you, your example earlier that you were talking to me about, about if I was visually impaired. Okay, and so, so first of all, we just simply don't, like I, I'm looking at you, or no, I have to be careful because there's all these value judgments. You're, you're closer to my age than someone else's. So I, I noticed that. I noticed that you present as a woman. 
I noticed that you look African American. That's what I'm assuming about you. You look like you're able-bodied. Looks like he has a disability. I, I'm aware of all of this, and as we're interacting, it's filtering in my response. There's no way I see you in just some universal thing that's not going to affect the way we, I talk to you, right? The assumptions I'm making about you. Somebody put it like this. It's like we have these barcodes on the back of our neck. Mm -hmm. When we're born, all of our group assignments, and then we know how to read the barcodes. And then we're taught like what it means that this person has this barcode. So, um, and of course you don't want to treat everyone the same because people have different needs. So, because I can see 12 point font, should I give all my students 12 point font when I have a sight impaired student? No, I need to make an extra accommodation for that person. I don't want to treat that person the same. Did you offer it in 16? I'm kind of blind. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I would. Um, I see people as individuals. You know, I don't care if you're pink, purple, or polka dotted. Anybody ever hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Promise me you'll never say it again. <laughs> uh, why do I say promise me you'll never say I don't care if you're pink, purple, or polka dotted? Because even then you're denying. Yeah, pe people don't come in those colors. It's so demeaning. Okay. Um, and race is real in the sense of what it means in our society. And so let's be real about it and don't just minimize me and say, I don't care. You know, I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you're a troll. I don't care if you're a fairy. You know, I don't. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, and you don't see. Here's the other thing: is this is what you just have to trust me. There's so much research on this, and you might think you see everybody as a unique person, and you just don't. And this can be scientifically proven. Okay. Uh, racism in the past, all of this doesn't have any meaning. These are my uh, that student's um, roommates, right? Everyone struggles, but if you work hard. Does anybody know what this is called? There's an ideology that leads to this. I mean, you're just getting, I gotta give someone else a chance. <laughs> well, the bootstrap myth, but there's another word, a fancy word. Meritocracy. Merit. That we have what we have because we worked for it and we earned it and we we had we earned it through our merit. Do you think um, Bill Gates' son is gonna work harder than you guys? No. no. How about Casey Affleck? He's in a new movie. Do you think it has anything to do with his brother? Right. <coughs> okay. Did you like that one? <laughs> All right. Um, so this is an ideology, right? That's hard to question. Um, my parents weren't racist. That's why I'm not racist. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Yeah. Or my parents were racist. That's why I'm not racist. Because yeah. right? it doesn't really matter what comes first, what comes second has to be I'm not racist because of the good, bad binary, right? Someone who tells me of oh, most of these things, this, 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 is telling me that they don't understand socialization. And they don't understand, um, I don't know why we think our parents are the sole, in are your parents the sole influence on you? Does <laughs> music or movies influence you? Did school? Did your teachers, did your friends, did your did your religion, did these things influence you? And then at what point did it stop and you're no longer influenced by anything? It never stops, it's, it's ongoing, right? That's how come I know how to use my phone. We didn't have those, right? I figured it out, I kept up. Uh, what else? So-and-so just happened to be black, you ever heard that? Race has nothing to do with it. Regardless of race, I hear that all the time, and that's another one I'd actually take out of your vocabulary. Because yeah. you just can't say it. You just simply can never take race. In this society, with all our conditioning, you just can't take race out, you can't take gender out. You might not know what it had to do with it, but it has something to do with it. So, let's say, I'm just, you're right in front of me, look like a white guy, are you? <laughs> all right. So, so you and I, you know, we're having a conflict and your voice starts going up. You think that I'm going to be reacting different to you because you're a man than I would if a woman's voice is going up? Of course I am, right? So we have a conflict, the way we talk, the words we say, our bodies, how we use them. 
we're going to be reading each other, and whether I'm whether I can map out exactly what gender had to do with it. Gender is in the way we're going to have a conflict. We've been deeply socialized into gender roles, right? And we bring our histories, right? There's a history of harm between men and women that's in the background, right? All of this, even even the way we hold our bodies and how much space we take up, and we're going to be reading those things as we fight. <laughs> All right, now, if we're sophisticated, Northwest <laughs> liberals, we might not say those things, right? We're hip enough, we know colorblind's not in anymore. I hope you know that. So here's what we'll say, right? We aren't going to be colorblind. We're going to do the opposite. I got so many friends of color. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to say, I work in a very diverse environment. People of color in my family. My second cousin married an Asian man. That's why I'm not racist. I'm just making fun here. I think we're going to be able to laugh at this stuff, so maybe if we kind of recognize it in ourselves. Um, someone who tells you this, how many of you have heard a white person say some version of that in a discussion of racism? Okay, a lot of hands are going up. So, so look how, just notice, look how common it is, right? Um, and as a sociologist, you 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 want to you want to look at patterns. Patterns are really helpful. Not when something's a pattern, it doesn't mean that it's true. It just means we've been conditioned to kind of say those things, right? So when a white person says some version of these things in a discussion of racism, they're giving you evidence, right? What what, what in their mind are they giving you their evidence of? Here's my evidence that. I'm not, I'm not racist, right? Okay. If this is my evidence, how am I defining racism? What's racism to me that that would, would seem to cover me? Yeah, because people can't be around each other. Diverse. Absolute conscious dislike, intolerance, hatred. I couldn't bear the sight. Three cubicles down of a person to cover. Um, or uh, there couldn't possibly be any kind of racial dynamic between me and my intimate partner. Right? This idea that these things disappear. Sometimes people will actually tell me that the reason they're not racist is they used to live in New York. Yeah. What? Anybody ever heard that one? Okay, I guess not. Because you walk by people of color and you do run screaming. So, you know, you're, you saw people of color, that's why you're not racist, right? I, I, I do want you to see the ridiculousness, right? Um, because we rarely, really think deeply about this stuff, right? Um, and that's why I have it on a dock, because it's so surface and superficial, okay? And I want, I want you to be able to think more critically about what are they really saying? What, what kind of framework are they drawing well, then I know I know where to go with them. Okay. Uh, what else do we say? This is real popular in Seattle. I live in the most diverse zip code in the U.S., Columbia City, which, by the way, is no longer um, very gentrified. East of New York. What else do we have? My children are so much more open. I do, I really do think um, that the. Are you guys? are called millennials, are you? What, what is this 18 to 19 to 20 year old generation called? Z. Generation Z? What is it? Z. Yeah, Z. So you know you've heard of the baby boomers, and then there's the millennials, and then there's the Z's, and there's this idea that this young generation is open, and I'm going to tell you, I, I don't see it. Uh, I see segregation. I see I see us not getting educated about race and racism, um, and there this idea that children today, you know, are just simply I don't know where you'd be open in, in, because schools are getting more segregated, uh, neighborhoods are getting more segregated, uh, the academy awards movies shape all of our understanding about everybody and the fact somebody just made a great parallel that us who, who Steve McQueen who directed 12 Years a Slave 
Um, he talked about that when MTV first came out, it was 100% white music, and then after 11 p.m. they played black music from African artists. Can you even imagine that? And can you imagine if only white music ever you were ever exposed to, what you would be missing? Okay. Think about movies. Not one single person of color was nominated for an award um, in pretty much any category. It is a, a deep apartheid, basically, in who gets to produce all of our images. So young people today are not less. Um, they, they are more um, this. <laughs> They're more, um, hey, it doesn't mean anything in my all-white neighborhood and my all-white school. That's what it looks like. And by the way, by, by age three and four, research shows all children know uh, and perf know that it's better to be white. When I say that, I hope you understand. I'm not saying that it's actually truly better, but that the message of our society is that it's better to be white. And all children receive it. And if you're the parent of children of color, you actually have to take the time to try to overcome in the same way that, I'm, that I wouldn't have to tell my son you can be anything, but I need to tell my daughter that you can do Right? I have to tell her, because everything else is telling her she's not. Okay? So um, all children get the message. And, and, um, okay. So if we go under the surface of that dot, what we see that crops up, you know, new racism. But what props up so much racial inequality where and at the same time individually most white people feel like they're kind of outside of any of this is the good bad binary. This idea that we're all unique individuals and I can simply decide to have been unaffected by all my conditioning. This idea that uh, we're all God's children. On some level, of course we are, right? But um, we don't live on that spiritual level, right? We live in the physical world where it very, very much matters, right? Um, and so just kind of insisting that it's focusing on race that's dividing us is actually just saying the answer to the problem is to pretend it doesn't exist and never talk about it. That's what that does. And we can see where that went with domestic violence, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Or sexual assault on campus. What, what kind of problem would we agree that the way to address is to never talk about it, pretend it doesn't exist? <coughs> Uh, internalized superiority, you can't, this is going to be a hard one, but white, white people, hang in there with me. You can't grow up in this society and not internalize a sense of being better than people of color. Whether you're aware of it or not, you just can't uh, avoid that message. It's so constant, and I spent a lot of time in my last presentation showing you those messages. I'm kind of jumping over that here. Um, it's often unconscious. I don't want those messages, but I can never be lax about it because every time I walk out the door, every advertising, every movie, every all-white environment I'm in, I'm constantly getting that message. Right? And then segregation. Whereas at this on this campus, this is now this is a very racially diverse campus, I believe. Not of course not your faculty administration, because that's kind of how it goes. Um, but I, and I, I don't know the South End, but I suspect that everyone in this room could name every neighborhood in the South End and then tell me what its racial makeup is. Am I right? Because that's the society. Um, so segregation. This is, this is what we're up against. Right? Okay. And maybe I should say ideology. Ideology. The way we justify and rationalize segregation is an ideology, right? It's natural. It's not actually, but it's actually enforced through decades of policies and practices. Segregation isn't natural. Segregation is enforced in many, many ways. It used to be legal, and now it's kind of under the radar, but it's still enforced, right? So think about ideology as the way we justify and rationalize <coughs> Inequality. Yeah. Could you say more about segregation as distinct from the natural affinity people have for people who look like them? Yes. Which does happen naturally. Yeah, and, 
and, I, and I'm not totally sure it's completely natural outside of being conditioned, but I do get that when you are a marginalized group, yes, absolutely, you just kind of want to be with other people that understand you and, and share your experience, right? And that, are, and, and that are not posing on you that you need to behave the way I think you need to behave, right? And so that kind of affinity to be with your own can be strong. And of course, that has a very different impact than what I want to be with my own, right? Because I'm in that dominant position. Um, I also have to do is look at the um, distribution of resources, and I think it tell, it puts the lie to this idea that it's natural that we all just want to be with our own. Because some groups want to be with their own with all the goods, and others want to be with their own in the with no no in the you know no health care nearby, no grocery stores, you know no services. I mean, you look at the difference in the way we distribute resources to those places. That's that's where I kind of go, okay, something else is going on there, right? If they were equal and we were separate, but they're not, we, we hoard uh, our resources. We love those good white schools, right? They're okay. We, we don't mind if schools are unequal as long as my kids go to the good school, right? I mean, if we, if we didn't, why would we stand for that if we didn't? Those who control the resources of yours. Does that help? Could you, like, you had a really great concrete example, I think, in your last presentation about um, the tent cities and... The what? Um, the tent cities for the home. Well, no, that was our gentrification panel. But um, on, like, how the north end, like, how the north end and the south end dynamic kind of plays out. Could you talk more about, like, how that type of segregation today I think it came up when somebody said, well, what about, there's a period often where locations are switching and it looks like integration, but what it really is is now that white people want the cities back, <laughs> right? We didn't want them before, we banned them, yeah. and we went out to the suburbs, love those suburbs. Well, now it's not convenient anymore, we don't want to be in the suburbs, so now we're coming back in and pushing people out, so there'll be a little bit of crossover. Um, that's why people are so proud of zip code 98118, right, when the, when the central district gentrifying, but it's now, it used to be, I don't know the statistics, it's just in the paper, something, we're like 90% African American, and now it's like about 10. So white folks know that it's really temporary, <laughs> that that kind of integration, and soon it's precisely valuable because it's going up. What's making it go up? White. It's getting whiter. And oftentimes when we're in those periods of cross, we're not actually integrated. We're not, we're not uh, supporting those small businesses that are owned by the local people in those communities. We're not um, building relationships with our neighbors, right? So that's what I said, yeah. Um, it used to be legal to literally draw lines on maps, and banks could do this and say, you can't give loans in these areas. Um, yeah, redlining. And so you kind of created ghettos and what we think of as slums. Um, that's not legal anymore, but now we just do it with the good schools, good neighborhood. Uh, it, is, it has been proven that uh, blacks and Latinos were targeted for the, the subprime mortgages just before the housing crash. Even when they qualified for better mortgages, they were pushed the really bad ones on them. And there's a lot of ways we do it today um, without like getting a pencil out you know, and drawing on the map. Okay. So we, we talked about these um, questions. And you know, having people reflect on, so think about, I'll just um, take you, you, think about it for yourself, um, particularly if you're a faculty member, right? If you're in a, or you're in a position of a kind of authority uh, on the campus, right? And you know, you're in charge of the curriculum and the policies and the practices. Um, and how racially diverse was your neighborhood growing up? So think about that. Um, the vast majority of white people grow up in segregation. So the answer for most white people to this question is my neighborhood wasn't racially diverse at all. So we don't grow up near people of color. And we also get messages about where they are and what kind of place it is, right? I mean, this is part of why, is it natural that I just want to be on my own or about my whole life I've been warned, don't go to that neighborhood? That's dangerous.
Uh, it's a deep question, but I would just say I've been conditioned to see you that way, whether I want to admit it or not. Um, and I, I project that onto you. And this is, again, this can be measured even if I'm not aware of it, right? But I, I had personally seen it because of the things that happened to me in my past, the white people are making it. Absolutely. Look at Trayvon Martin. He was in a gated white community. But, but this, is, this is the difference between personal prejudice and institutional power. Who, which group has the power to control who gets what, who gets to go where, um, and who gets to tell the story? Who gets to write the story about what's safe and what's dangerous? That's the difference. This, the, this group is in the position to do that. And we're going to do it in a way that serves our interests. This is what I want you to challenge. I'm not saying this as if, it, I, I, if we can't, we have to understand how all this works. So we can we can start challenging it. So we'll just keep going. Um, and the next one is to think about when's the first time you had a teacher of the same race as you, or races if you're multiracial, and how often that happened. And um, when's the first time you had a teacher of a different race? And the vast majority of white people's answer to this question is, from the time I began, I could even have gone through graduate school and never have a teacher of a different. And for people of color, the answer is, I don't know if I've ever had a teacher of my own race, or maybe once, or maybe twice, or maybe not until college, right? Okay. So, from, again, I'm wanting you to get the difference in how we get socialized. And so, um, those teachers, the teaching force, which, by the way, is about 92% white nationwide, they answer these questions like most other white people. They grow up in segregated neighborhoods. They only um, have white teachers. So where do they get their, mis their understanding of people of color? From terrible sources like movies and TV and reality shows and jokes and comments and warnings. And now they're in the position to decide which children are good, which children are smart, which children should be punished, who's naturally innocent and who's naturally criminal. There's, you can't miss having all that in your head because you've been absorbing the culture, right? I was just watching, I started watching Training Day. How many of you have seen Training Day? It's a very popular movie and I couldn't, I couldn't watch anymore because you've got your innocent white guy and your bad, bad. Even when, when African Americans are always either cops or criminals, but even when they're cops, they're connected to kind of crime. And um, that's how, you know, all of that, that's what I absorb. And now I'm looking out at this class of children, and it's coming out in the way I respond. And again, this is empirically measurable in who gets punished for the same crime, you know, infraction. Who gets it picked up out of a chair and thrown across a room? Um, all of that, right? Um, and you have a school to prison pipeline. And individually, those white teachers are, they're good, you know, they're nice people, they don't mean to be doing it, but they can't. This is the problem. We grew up separate, we absorb these messages, and we're in these really powerful positions. Okay. I showed this to you, I'm gonna show it to you again, because I think it's so um, powerful, and also I'm thinking about the kind of questions you're asking. These, these are the college champion Jeopardy playoffs. These are champions. These are college educated champions. And look at the board at the end of their round. There's a category not one of them touched. You know, obviously it was hard. <laughs> they didn't want to lose and they didn't feel smart enough for that category. And for me, yeah, it would be astrophysics or something like that. Remember, college This is, this is, just take it in. And, I, and I, I don't know how to explain the power of knowing our history, but the further we get away from knowing our history, the further we get away from being able to address institutional racism. And this is the result of a, of a white teaching force that grew up separate from people of color that was trained. Put it this way, from the time I began school, I've been taught by white people, we've been taught by white people, we've been taught by white people, for white people, by white people. Do you get it? Do you get the weight of that? Mm -hmm. 
trust me, I'm a, I'm a professor of education. I'm, I'm, I'm waking up as fast as I can. But we have a crisis. We've got to understand what the problem is. And this is one institution. I'm not even talking about medicine or I'm talking about education. And I'm not even talking about the textbooks. I'm talking about the teachers. Do you see the cage? Do you see what I mean when I say racism is a system that reproduces itself and that <laughs> uh, that I can't help but be benefiting and participating and colluding if I'm not actively challenging. Yeah, please. So, well, when, we're, when you showed this, and I saw it last week, I actually um, turned to Kelsey and said, when you said these are college educated, and I said to Kelsey, are they college educated? I, 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 I argue whether or not they're college educated for the very reason that you mentioned. Um, their education is very limited. Yeah. They don't know anything about African American history, so are they college educated? And you define what constitutes a college education. And this is another example of power. Who gets to define it? Mike, who gets to define it? And who's going to get a good job? The ones that got that education then. It's not the ones that didn't get that education. Who are very highly educated. Just a 
great interruption to all this arrogance that this sets up in us. Um, need to maintain white solidarity, safe things to look good. White solidarity is the unspoken agreement amongst whites um, that we won't uh, hold each other accountable around our racism. We won't make each other uncomfortable. So that's why at the family dinner when Uncle Bob says that thing and everybody cringes but nobody says anything because we don't want to make Uncle Bob uncomfortable. Uh, that's white solidarity. Let's protect Uncle Bob. I want it to be where Uncle Bob is uncomfortable and five people are in their integrity. <laughs> Guilt, which paralyzes or is an excuse for inaction. I feel so bad, you're making me feel bad, you just want me to feel bad. No, I don't need to feel bad, unless it motivates you. I'll take it if it motivates you. Just, come on, the best antidote to guilt is action. Yeah. So is the guilt arising from the unacknowledged, uh, knowing that racism exists that you're benefiting and then feeling bad, but not being able, where is that coming from? Yeah, when you sourcing know, it. We're kind of a funny mix, right? On the one hand, we really don't see this, and we're taught not to see this. We actually get punished for seeing this. We get a lot of, like, you bring it up at a party, and everyone's going to tell you to lighten up, and, you know, we just get so much pressure not to ruin things, not to be so sensitive, right? We do. And so after a while, we stop seeing it. Oh. Uh, and we don't really want to see it, right? So here's this, like, really don't get it. And here's this. <coughs> no. We know. We know. But we can never admit it. Because it conflicts with our sense of ourselves as good people. And that makes us crazy making. That makes us irrational. That makes us, like if we really don't know, we really do know, we can't admit it. We, uh, we do feel bad because we would never want to hurt you. I mean, I think that's sincere. I would never want to um, at the same time, I'm deeply invested in racism in ways I don't even know because all my life it's been a tragedy. I don't even, I don't even know where I'm, where I'm actually working against challenging it because it's worked. You know what I mean? We're a mess. Good. Good. We're pieces of work. Are we not? Have you noticed that? It's been all pretty. Yeah, yeah. Crank her, right? Crank her. Crank All right. Um, and defensiveness. I have another one on here. And we want to focus on our intentions rather than the impact. And um, I can actually, uh, I think I have this on a handout that you're going to get. So then you can email me for this. So focus on intentions over impact. Right? But I didn't mean to. Right. But you did. But I didn't mean to. So basically what I'm saying, if I didn't mean to hurt you, it doesn't count. So stop. <laughs> stop going on about it. I didn't mean to. <laughs> All right. So I called all this white fragility. We're really fragile around this because we live in a very racial, racially insular bubble. I mean, I, I can, I was, I was valedictorian. I graduated summa cum laude. I delivered the commencement speech at Seattle University, and I had um, absolutely never in my life had my racial worldview challenge. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know I had a racial. Until I applied for a job that I wasn't qualified for, but of course I got, <laughs> uh, to be a diversity trainer. And I just thought, well, I'm qualified for that because I'm a vegetarian. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And I'm all, it's all, that's what's open. That's what this is. And I get this job, and I don't, oh my God, right? People of color are just Okay? And we just can't handle it. And we need you to stop, and we will do whatever it takes. I'm going to argue with you, I'm going to cry, I'm going to storm out of the room, I'm going to withdraw, I'm going to avoid you. I need you to stop so I can get back into my comfort zone. Does this make sense? Have you seen this? I want that equilibrium back. So I think it functions as a kind of bullying. I'm going to make it so miserable for you, you're just not going to do that again. You're not going to bring it up again. You ever seen any of this? I mean, how many... The folks of color in the room, how often have you given white people, or tried to give white people feedback on our inevitable but often unaware racism and had that go well for you? Has be open and receptive. And I once asked a group, I think I said this in the last, it's just so moving for me, 
All right, so what would your daily life be like if you could just tell us when we step in it and have us graciously receive, reflect, and try to change? What would your life be like? Oh, would you mind if you get a few more years on the end of your life? I'm serious. This is about high blood pressure. This is about heart disease. This is about diabetes. And I, I have this bad coach say to me, what would my life be like? It would, it would be radical. you don't know you have, to start from there and, and then be thrilled that someone's willing to take a risk on you. Because most of the time you don't bother, right? Folks of color, how many times you just say, I'm not even going to bother? It's too hard. So if you're going to bother with me, you probably saw something in me that said, I think I want to take a risk. I think she can do it. And you probably spent hours agonizing, building up your processing and then going and trying and then how I respond is going to really dictate whether we ever have a good relationship again and if I don't respond well and you stop talking to me unfortunately I'll go oh there's no problem at all she's never said anything <laughs> if you have a relationship with a person of color and you're not talking about racism it's probably not as close as you think it is <laughs> if you're white all right so let's look at some of the triggers. And a lot of these triggers are um, challenges to ideology. This is why ideology is such a key concept to understand, right? So suggesting that a white person's viewpoint comes from a racial frame of reference. In other words, well, you just say that because you're white. Well, we don't like that. White people do not like that. <laughs> because you just challenge the objectivity. And my whole life, I'm the one that gets to be objective. You are the one that has a chip on your shoulder and play the race card. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Uh, people of color talking directly about race. Ooh, ooh, ooh. We, we, we don't talk about race, right? Um, people of color choosing not to protect our feelings and um, just kind of calling it like it is. And that challenges my expectations and sense of entitlement to be comfortable. Nothing like that. Yes. Um, people of color not being willing to tell their stories or answer questions. This is, I'm going to admit it, when, we were, when I started that diversity contract and we were in the train the trainer and us white folks, and just notice, I wasn't qualified if I didn't understand racism. I wasn't qualified to be a diversity trainer. But rather than feel like I better hide the fact that I'm not qualified, I took great umbrage that the people of color wouldn't tell me how racism works. And I actually said, well, how am I supposed to know if you don't tell me? Right? Without every, I mean, can you imagine? any other situation. I now understand that that's not your responsibility. That's, that's for me. Um, essentially, you're going to do my work for me. You take all the risks, you do all the hard work, mm -hmm. you hand me the fruits of your labor, and I will examine it and see. Right? Right? A fellow white person not agreeing with you about what happened. Uh, that's a challenge to white solidarity. Receiving feedback that uh, you, what you did had a racist impact, that's a challenge to white liberals. Suggesting that group membership is significant, that that's a challenge to individualism. Right? Acknowledgement that access is unequal, that's a challenge to meritocracy. Being presented with a person of color in a position of leadership, a challenge to white authority. And, and by the way, a person of color is only going to be in leadership if they keep white people comfortable. Uh -huh. right. Too much of that, and you're not going to be in that position. You're just going to be a problem. Being presented with information about other ra racial groups through, for example, movies. Um, challenge to white centrality, right? Black History Month, Multicultural Academy. Do you have another one? So here's what I want to do. I want to give you a chance to talk, because I've been talking for a while, and it's afternoon. At your tables, I think I have it on here. This stopped working. Um, talk about, um, it's not going even to here. Okay, there. Okay. If you're white, how, how do you see 
see this in your own life? How have you seen, you might not have ever thought about it like that before, but how have you seen these dynamics manifest for you? Um, and what strategies might you use to counter it? Right? How might you build your stamina? Because it's, you know, it's easier said than done. It's hard to receive feedback, right? But we have to uh, make ourselves ready. If you're a person of color, uh, multiracial, have you seen white fragility manifesting? Um, and what do you wish white people understood? Okay, so at your tables, maybe just open by saying, what is your racial identity? So, I'm Robin, I'm white. And then, take turns. Yeah. Actually, that's a color, not a racial identity, but would be Caucasian. Would that be more ethnically consistent? No, actually. I, I really deliberately, because race is such a construct, right? So. Um, my ethnicity is Italian, but my race is white. And um, Caucasian is actually comes out of the old race, scientific racism. So they had the like four groups: Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid. And if we think about it, we don't they're, they're, we don't use those terms anymore, right? They're pretty offensive, and they came out of that early like scientific racism where they measured skulls and they said, "Oh, yeah, our brains are bigger than yours." So. Uh, Caucasian is actually kind of an outdated term. I know a lot of people use it, but it's I, I would use it. It's on the government forms. So I would say black, not African Americans, for the purposes of this discussion. Yeah. Oh, oh you know what? Whatever your identity is, that, that's up to you, right? If, if yours is black or African American, whatever, you get to decide. You, I mean, you get to name that. <laughs> All right. Have fun. Talk. And on that note, I want to. Thank you. This is actually one of the richest discussions I've had in a really long time. So thank you so much.